so we are in our second set here of our, our summer series called The Easy Yoke. And today we're going to talk about priorities. We're going to talk about priorities. Now, it's interesting as we begin to do that because as, as we start to talk about that, I think my initial reaction is to like make a list. Okay, this comes first, that comes first, that comes first. You know, and, and the, the things that successively follow from that. Uh, but my hope is, based upon the words of Jesus, based upon what he taught here, we'll, we'll begin to see priorities maybe slightly different than that. Rather than an order of, of firstness and then successive lists, I think we're going to see something really important here. And so I, w- I want to start or open up this discussion by talking about the fact that each of us have limits. And that these limitations that we have in life are actually a gift from God. They're they're built into life by design. They they function as a sort of governor in our lives that keep us from maxing out beyond our capacity. They keep us in a place and in a position of having to depend upon the Lord. Now, if you think about it, the nature of sin itself is really an attempt to live outside of the limitations that God has designed for us. All sin really can kind of be reduced to that. God says, here is my will, here are the limitations that I've given you. And and pretty much all sin is a function of saying, I don't like those limitations, I would like to live beyond those limitations. In fact, the life of Jesus is a display for us of what it looks like to embrace limitations at every level. So just for a moment, I, w- I want to take uh, uh, just a second here to talk about the limitations that Jesus embraced, limitations that were a part of the incarnation or his becoming human or adding to himself a human nature and then experiencing life as a human. And a lot of times we don't think about the limitations of Jesus, but but they are there and they're abundant. First of all, Jesus, the uncreated second person of the Trinity, added to himself a human nature and body. This means that Jesus was born in a human body. Think about that for just a moment. Think about that reality. In the incarnation, God, the uncreated one, the one who spoke into existence everything that exists, the one who set the laws of the universe, right? He's the reason that math works. (laughs) He's the reason that light travels at a specific speed. He's the reason that the earth hangs on nothing. That's all by his design, all by his divine power. And yet, now all of a sudden, all of who he is resides in a human body. He didn't get somebody else's body. He only had his own. He was born anatomically a male. He faced all the stages of human growth. That means that he had to nurse at his mother's breast when he was a baby. He had to learn how to walk. He had to learn how to talk and use his body. Probably went through that awkward, you know, preteen stage where your legs outgrow your brain's ability to balance. He started growing facial hair at some point was tired, had to go through puberty, had to sleep, had to eat, had to endure, walking everywhere. It was, he was born pre-cars. He was raised in a, in a blue-collar family and had to learn to work with his hands. No doubt in the process, I, I would imagine that at some point he smashed his thumb. Or maybe even he had a, a cut, a, cut a board more than once. 
He had limitations that were bodily, bodily limitations. He also had time limitations. Jesus really only had 24 hours in the day, same as the rest of us. All he had was the time that was allotted to him. He had limitations of presence. Jesus could only be in one place at one time. He could not be everywhere at once, meeting all the needs at once. He had limitations of capacity. There were only so many things that Jesus could actually do. And in the process of doing them, he became tired and had to rest. And sometimes he just flat out passed out in the middle of a boat during a storm. He had financial limitations. He was not wealthy. And since Jesus had a limited self-existence, limited time, limited capacity, limited resources, Jesus had to make choices in life. It meant that he could not give all of his attention to all of the things. It meant that there were some things in life that he would have to sort of set aside in order to devote himself and to give himself and give his attention to certain things and not other things. It meant that he valued certain things over other things in life. And in the life and in the teachings of Jesus, we can see that there are a great many things that Jesus could do. But he only chose to do some of them. Now, we also are experiencing in this season a a time of limitation, are we not? (laughs) Globally, we are having to embrace limitation. Here's just a quick diagnostic question. What is your response to the disruptions or to the limitations that are happening? What is, what is happening on the inside of your heart? Do you feel like a fire rising up in you? You're like, ah, Kate Brown or, you know, whoever, Donald Trump or whatever it is, right? You're angry at somebody, not quite sure who yet. Is it Dr. Fauci? Is it, is it, you know, whoever? It doesn't matter. You know, we can see real quickly where our values lie, but what irritates us when we find ourselves limited. We can begin to really analyze in our own hearts where our idols are based upon how we react when certain freedoms or what we feel are rights are taken away. And here in this section, we're going to see Jesus talking in, this is the middle of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. It lasts from Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7. It's been called the Constitution of the kingdom for good reason. It is the teaching of Jesus on how people within the kingdom will live. Now, Jesus has just finished telling the crowd that God is more interested in what is happening in our hearts than what we appear to be doing on the outside. So he he deals with our, our giving and our generosity. It's like, hey, don't let your right hand know what you're Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And and he says, like, give in secret. Do it in such a way that you're not displaying it for everybody. Just do it for the Father. Do it for God. Give generously out of just a pure heart. And then he talks about prayer, right? He says, look, the Gentiles, those outside of God's kingdom, all focus on, on praying with lots and lots of words because they think that they're going to be heard for their much speaking. And, they, and then the Pharisees, those within God's kingdom, they pray in such a way that they think that they're going to be on display and it's some sort of show of their own holiness. Just don't, don't do that. Matter of fact, like get somewhere where nobody can see you. I talk to the Father like that. Make it about you and him. 
He talks about fasting. And there was a tradition between uh, those that were religious in that day that whenever they would fast, they would put on sackcloth, which was like this rough burlap type of, uh, you know, uncomfortable clothing to make themselves even more miserable while they were fasting. Not as if, you know, it's not as if uh, having no food was difficult enough. You just needed to add to that, right? And then the other thing that you do is you'd make your face really long. A lot of times people would anoint their faces with olive oil to make them kind of shine. And, and so during a fast, they wouldn't anoint their face with oil. They'd just go out in public and just look grimy and dirty and wearing burlap and sweaty and sour and hungry and angry. Right? And they'd go like, I'm so holy. Look at me. <laughs> Jesus is like, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't have that kind of attitude. And then he, he, he begins to talk about this idea of treasures. Here's where we're headed. If, there are three sort of file folders of thought here that I want you to take note of under the heading of priorities. First of all, treasuring the right treasure. If you're taking notes, under this heading of priorities, treasuring the right treasure, that's Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. And secondly, undivided loyalty equals unequaled peace. Undivided loyalty equals unequaled peace. Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34. And then number three, and this is where we're going to wrap things up here, is that it means a change in how we live. It means a change in how we live. And Walter, you can leave those slides up so that people can write those down and... and uh, have those as a resource for their notes, a place to put ideas. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19, Jesus, in the middle of this, this talk about the inward versus the outward, what's happening in the heart versus the action on the outside, he says this in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy where thieves break in and steal. But, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So in the Greek here, it, it's really interesting. It doesn't come through in English when it says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure. Literally in the Greek, it says, stop treasuring treasures on earth, right? And then he, he goes on to say, start treasuring treasures in heaven. <laughs> and I, I like that phrasing. He says, treasuring treasures, because again, it, it, it locates the battle at the heart of what is happening on the inside. Treasuring the right treasure has an effect in your life. In verses 19 through 21, you can see that it's about your affections. Again, for note takers, it's about your affections. You see, from the Jewish perspective, the word heart here speaks of the mind, speaks of the will and of the emotions. It, it, it's the place, it's the, the seat uh, within your own life where all decisions are made and where all affections are felt. So when he says in the first few verses here, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, he's saying what you value, what you set your affections on, will set the direction for your life. And if you set your affections, if your heart rests upon the things that are temporary, it will have an effect on the whole of your life. Your affections set your direction. 
So right off the bat, I mean, he's, he's going to talk about finances here, but we're going to see that there's a deeper uh, underlayer, if you will, to his logic. That it's really, finances are a fruit of an underlying belief system that values this earth over the kingdom. This is a huge point. It really opens up this passage for us to begin to understand. And so he says, listen, it's about your affections. Where you, where you put your affections, either on this world or on the kingdom of God, will change the course of your life. He makes it even clearer in the subsequent verses, in verses 22 and 23. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But... If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So here's, here's let me simplify this just a little bit. He, he says, in the same way that good eyes fill the body and the mind with light. Help you to see. You're filled with light when you've got good eyes. And bad eyes fill the body with darkness. If your eyes don't work, you can't see, and on the inside, it's just darkness from the inside perspective of a person who has blindness. He is saying it is not only about your affections, but it is also about your focus. In the same way that a bad eye affects the inward man and a good eye affects the inward man, what you are focused on in life affects the inward man. He's drawn an analogy for us. So it's, first of all, when it comes to treasuring the right treasure, it's about your affections. And second of all, it's about your focus. What you focus on will fill your life with desires. And he says, if your eye is bad, how great is the darkness? If if, if then the light in you is darkness. How great is the darkness in verse 22? He's saying, listen, this affects you at the deepest level. Your affections and your focus affect the course of your life. And then thirdly, he says in verse 24 that it's about fidelity. Notice what he says here. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now again, he's talking about living for this earth, living for the treasures you can accumulate here, living for life on this world. And he says here, this is really about fidelity. You can only devote yourself fully. You can only truly love one thing or the other. It is either God and his kingdom, or it is this world and all of its treasures that, that can be stolen by thieves, that can be corrupted by moths or rust, that are temporary and that fade away. You have to choose one or the other. Bob Dylan was right. You have got to serve somebody. You can't worshipfully serve the temporary world. You have to choose whose kingdom you value more. And in contrast, he's pitting one against the other. He's like, look, there is a kingdom here that is temporary. It's, it's so temporary that you just when you think you have it, somebody can steal it away. It's so temporary that when you hang it in the closet, moths can come in and destroy it. Or it's out of fashion next week. It's so temporary that it has to be polished because it corrupts and tarnishes. 
So there is one way of living for the things that are temporary that are always in jeopardy, or there's another way of living for the things that are eternal that cannot be jeopardized. One is temporary, one is eternal, one has treasure that can be lost, corrupted, or stolen, and one has treasure that can never be lost. It's interesting, some of the phrasing in the previous verses here suggests a sort of double entendre in Jesus' wording here. It's the idea that you can't have a double focus, double vision, right? A bad eye. You can't sort of live a a, a cross-eyed existence where you're like, I'm focusing on God's kingdom here, but then I'm also focused on the world over here. If you live in that way, your desires will be at war within you. They will be in conflict within you. You can't live a cross-eyed existence. Where you are focused on more than one thing at a time, on two things at once. So this, is, this is an idea, actually, that James picks up in the book of James we, in our men's Bible study on Tuesday mornings for Zoom. Um, we, we just went through this passage where it talks about being double-minded. James says this in James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, it's not saying don't love people out in the world. It's saying, look, when you set your affections on this world that is fading away, that's perishing, when you set your heart on those things, you actually Put yourself in a position that is opposed to God. You're at war with God by loving this world only. He goes on to say that the solution then in this battle is to draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded, two focuses, cross-eyed. You can't set your affections on the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God. They are not in congruence with one another. They are opposed to each other. And Jesus is saying that the problem isn't so much money itself, it's divided loyalties that result from the pursuit of this world or this life only. It's that mentality. And so he says, listen, you can't serve two masters. You, you're going to love one and hate the other. You're going you're gonna to despise one or, or you're going to serve the other, but you, you cannot have two opposing kingdoms held together in one set of desires. They don't work together. They're at odds with each other. And so he carries on into the following verses in this second section where he says that undivided loyalty equals unequaled peace. Verse 25 starts with the phrase, therefore. So based upon this understanding that we can't have divided affections, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat What you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food? And the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So let's pause here for just a moment. In this idea of having undivided loyalty, Jesus says, therefore, I don't want you to get caught up in the anxieties of this world. Okay? I don't want that. 
Because follow Jesus' logic here. The God who made it all sustains it all. In verses 25 to 29, he says, the God who made it all is the one who sustains it all. Everything necessary for the life cycle of the sparrow and the life cycle of the lily of the field and the grass that grows was graciously provided for and designed by God. He's the one who made it all, and he's the one who sustains it all. And here's the point of what he's saying. It's like, when you are focused on the world, there is an anxiety that grows in the heart. And it... it, It really is this anxiety that grows from from feeling like, well, in order to have the life that I want, I need to have the stuff that I need that will give me that life. Food, clothing, water, those are the basics. But they stretch beyond that, especially in an opulent society like the one that we live in. It's the highest speed internet that is known to man. It's a Wi-Fi router that can reach to the edge of your property. It's the latest car, boat, toy. And and guys, i got to be honest. I'm guilty of that. I can find myself lost in Amazon for like an hour and a half. Online, like just shopping items, looking at reviews, wondering what my life would be like if I got the latest gadget or backpacking gear or e-bike or whatever it is, right? But does it provide peace? No, actually, it makes us anxious. It makes us anxious. Why? Because... In verses 30 through 32, a lack of trust comes from a desire to control. He says, but if God clothes the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles... Seek after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Okay, now follow again the logic. Control is an illusion. When we think that it is up to us, right, to get everything that we need in order to have a happy and fulfilled life, when we're living for this world and this kingdom here that is temporary and fading away, when we live in such a way where we set our affections on there and our joy then comes from the things that we can amass or the experiences that we can have or the places that we can go or the things that we want to do, there is never any rest because it is up to me to attain those things. All of the responsibility falls upon my shoulders of, like, how long has it been since we really had a nice vacation? I guess I should work a little harder. I guess I should get another job. I guess I, maybe we should sell this or sell that or upgrade our home. And we really need a hot tub because if we're going to have a fulfilled life, we really need a place to soak. When we set our affections on the things of this earth, we we begin to try and control our lives in such a way that we can have all the things that we think are going to make us happy in life. But that control is an illusion. All the things that we have are provided by God. Now, that doesn't get away, that doesn't do away with effort and hard work and, and learning and ability or gifts or any of those things, but... Do you know how quickly those things can go away? I remember the last time the housing bubble popped. We got into a house early on in Cave Junction, and we thought, oh, man, this is going to be a great investment for our future. And then next thing you know, we were like $100,000 upside down in our house in Cave Junction. 
And rather than being a great investment in our future, it was a great detriment to our future. The idea that I could somehow control the outcome of my life is a mere illusion. God is in control of those things. And he says, the unbelievers, verse 32, they seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. The responsibility to care for your life and to give you peace God takes upon himself. And he's already thought about it. Say, okay, but Jeremy, you're starting to sound like a socialist. Do we just throw our hands up in the air and not have a work ethic? No, listen. Watch as this passage unfolds. And what you're going to see is that when our priorities are properly aligned, we get everything else with it. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Listen. In this issue of undivided loyalty, equaling unequaled peace, The God who made everything sustains it all, Jesus says. And what is really happening is when you set your affections on the things of this world, you're a person of little faith. You're not really trusting the Father. And, And you're seeking to control and get what you want from this world because all you can think about is this life here now. You're narrowly focused to a temporary kingdom. What's the cure for that? Verse 33 and 34. The kingdom is the cure. Now hear what he's saying. When we seek first the kingdom and the king, everything that we need for an amazing life comes with it. And by entrusting our lives to him and making a life that pleases him, when we make that our primary focus, everything else in life comes into alignment. Now, in contrast to that, if we make ourselves the king and this world the kingdom, then all the cares of the world are ours and we bear those alone. When I come under the authority of King Jesus and I make his kingdom my priority, he takes care of all the overhead. See how that works? He takes that responsibility for the members of his kingdom that are under his authority. He takes that responsibility for himself. The kingdom then is the cure. Instead of living a distracted, scattered life where we go, okay, I just, in order to have peace, in order to have a right life, in order to to really enjoy this existence that God's given me, what I really need then is a new car or a new experience or a place that I can travel or the latest home or a, a, a smart, you know, feature in our home that I could turn the lights on and off with my phone, whatever it is, right? And then all of that weight rests upon me to gain what I can in order to live the best temporary life that I can. He says, that's so short-sighted. Live for the kingdom and you get it all. Live for the world and you miss it all. Live for the kingdom and you get it all. When it comes to priorities... We have to understand this truth. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that is the way to live under his rule, and then everything that you desire 
at a base level, at a root level, will be provided by God, by the Father, for you. Now, here's the beauty of this. In our country, we're distracted with many things. In other places in the world, there are people that are very, very poor. As a matter of fact, Jesus' audience was also likely very poor. Can you imagine for them what, what Jesus' words would sound like? Saying, I, I can have everything that I need if I just place my affections in the right kingdom? If I come under the authority of the king of the kingdom? You're, you're saying that I'll, I'll get it all? Yes, listen. What we want in a vacation is, is, is most likely rest and peace. Right? Isn't that pretty much what we want in a vacation? Like a, a beach somewhere, a nice palapa, cold drink on our hand, looking at the waves. We imagine ourselves in that place. We're like, oh, that sounds so good. Peace. No more busyness. Jesus is saying, listen, when you come under my authority and my rule, that kind of peace is your daily experience. That's the life that I promised you. And it's not that we don't still have cares in this world. Matter of fact, he goes on to say in verse 34, listen, don't worry about tomorrow because today is going to have enough trouble of its own. There's still going to be ongoing things that are happening, but peace that passes our understanding. We say, oh no, it's, it's not, that's not what I dream about, Jeremy. What I dream about is getting a husband or a wife and, and not being alone and not feeling so lonely in life. Have you ever felt so loved that somebody would die for you? That's what Jesus did. He's saying, I'll love you like that every day. What we really want in this world is, is, is root desires in our hearts to be met. And Jesus is saying, kingdom living provides all of that without the need for the stuff. And he'll take care of our needs as well. Food and water, the things that we need. Okay. You say, Jeremy, that, that, that's great. I understand he's calling us to focus on the kingdom first. He's saying, saying that we, we can't have a divided loyalty, that when we get our hearts right and we have undivided loyalty and we live for the reality of this kingdom over here, and we put ourselves under the authority of the king that the, the root desires of our heart will be met in the Lord. Okay, I, I get all of that, but what does that practically look like in life? How does that get lived out? Because quite honestly, Jeremy, I experience a lack of peace, and sometimes I don't feel super loved. Sometimes joy is not the fruit that is happening in my life. It's frustration and a whole lot of other things. What does this actually look like? Well, first of all, I want you to understand something. In order to, to, to step into this reality, we have to embrace the teaching of Jesus as being true. This is for us. It's a promise. And we have to act on that promise. Now, it's really interesting to me in, in theological circles and in some places even that I sort of cut my teeth theologically or spiritually early on in my life, one of the ways that this passage, Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, gets taught is by saying that this section of Scripture is really meant to frustrate people and to help them to see their need for a Savior. And so Jesus is setting sort of lofty, high ideals when he says, you know, love your enemies and turn the other cheek and walk two miles and pray in the closet, and he, he says all of these things. It's saying, like, he, th those who are part of this camp would say, he sets the standard so high for righteousness, for holiness, that no person can possibly attain it. And therefore, they will understand their need for a Savior. And while that sounds good, I think, I think it misses the summary of this teaching. If you flip over, just real quick, flip over to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. After giving this sermon, he, his final point, if you will, is this in verse 24. 
Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded upon the rock. Again, the person who hears the teaching and lives it out, who does it, their foundation will be solid, and when the storms of life come, they're not rocked by them. Now, let's see the other side of the coin. Verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. The person who hears those words and then nothing changes in their life. Nothing else happens. They go, oh, that's a cool little fun fact. But then their lives are never reprioritized. They never step into loving their enemies or they never step into praying in private and talking to Jesus in deep, deep ways. If they never actually put those things into practice, he says, what will happen is the storms of life come and what happens is your house collapses. It's got no foundation. So we have to be utterly persuaded and convinced that the teaching and the words of Jesus, then, are for us to actually do, to actually live out. That is our sure foundation. Not just the hearing of these teachings, but the doing of them. Jesus expects those who are part of his kingdom to live according to kingdom principles. And this teaching, or this part that we've looked at then, tells us that we have to prioritize the kingdom above all other things. And that if we do that, the rest of life will sort of fall into line. It teaches us how kingdom people live. Now, I want to... Just pause for one second, because I think we all need to hear this. I need to hear this. Because those teachings of Jesus do have lofty ideals. I want to love my enemies, or I want to want to love my enemies. But it's not easy, right? Everything in my flesh fights against private prayer or fasting. This world and all of its wares are pretty attractive, and it seems very permanent. It all carries the illusion of permanence. And it feels like it's going to be here forever, but it's not going to be here forever. The only thing that's going to last is the kingdom of God. That's it. And so, I feel the temptation. I feel the pulling at my soul. And I just want to, I just want to say this. This is what discipleship is. It is the process, this is what sanctification is. It is the process by which God reorders the whole of our life to be centered around his kingdom. It's the way in which we grow. So it, we have to embrace that this teaching is for us, but the second thing is we have to take action. That's what it means. It means we have to take action. We can either live a self-centered life or we can live a God-centered life. So I I want you to take a look here at this this chart. Here's a self-centered life. This is how we oftentimes view life. It's us in the middle and everything else in life is, is gauged upon how it affects us. Okay? So when we think about God, for example, we say, okay, I, I love God because he adds to my life. And, and following him means that I'm going to be happier, healthier, wiser, you know, whatever else. And so I am satisfied in my relationship with God based upon how he helps me to experience the life that I want. Okay? That's me as the king and my kingdom. Time is the same way. 
You can see the arrows pointing inward. And I think about time in terms of like, how is my time being used and how does it make me feel? And I think about possessions and relationships and money and labor, the work that I do, all in the same way. Is it adding to my experience of life in such a way that meets my desires and satisfies my wants or needs? And this is how we start out living looking at the world like an eyeball here, looking at the world through our lens and saying, how does the world affect me? And we gauge our happiness in every area of life. I like my job because how it makes me me feel. But then tomorrow, when I'm not appreciated in the way that I think I should be appreciated, now all of a sudden I don't like my job. And what happens is when you're in the center, all of the areas of life are in constant fluctuation. Our our, our sense of joy in life is fluctuating with how each of those areas make us feel. That is a self-centered life. But but Jesus is calling us to a God-centered, a kingdom-centered life. And if you check out this next chart, we can see that instead of God being peripheral and his kingdom being peripheral, We move God to the middle, and now we begin to ask a different set of questions. Now we begin to say, okay, now, how do these things become useful or accentuate or bring glory to God and his kingdom? Now I look at myself up here in the upper right-hand corner, and I think about my body, my soul, and my spirit, all that comprises me. How do each of those areas bring glory to God. How do I glorify God with my body? That's going to mean abstaining from certain sins. That's going to mean the management of my personal well-being. How do I bring God glory with my soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions? How do I bring God glory with my spirit, the part of me that relates to him? How do I bring God glory with my time? How do I take my time and invest it like into the stock market of eternity? And I I begin to say differently, like how can I carve out time for me? Instead I say, God, all of time belongs to the eternal Father. Now how do I steward my time for your glory? And sometimes that will involve rest and sometimes that will involve labor. And now I'm looking at other areas like relationships. How do my relationships bring glory to God? And money, how do I use the resources God's given me to bring glory to God and possessions and my work? And I start to think in terms that are, that are, that are centralizing the kingdom of God in my life to such a degree that all of a sudden, every area of my life comes into alignment and has meaning and purpose. It causes me to live with intention. Now, it is one thing to look at the chart. It is another thing to apply it to our lives. This will mean that over the course of our lives that there are some things that we will do and some things that we will not do. We will have to embrace limitations. As we grow in this discipline of having a properly prioritized life, the kingdom of God will take up every area of our lives. And when I say the kingdom of God, what I'm saying is people who live under the commands and authority of King Jesus and are living for eternal joy with him forever. That's it. God's people, under God's authority, in God's place. And and, and that's what we're we're supposed to be living for. And as we grow in this discipline of proper priorities, the Father will do what he has promised to do. In John 15, 2, we're told this, that every branch that bears fruit, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, you guys are the branches. Any branch that's not bearing fruit, my Father cuts away. But any branch that is bearing fruit, he prunes in order that it might bear fruit, more fruit. Now, I didn't really understand this until I lived on a house 
on Archer Way. And there were some old vines that were scraggly old vines, and they, um, they were growing out on the ground. They were not uh, cared for properly. And, and so they were just kind of wild vines. And they grew like five grapes spread out on the ground, dirty. You know, they just did not do well. So I started reading. I'm like, I'm going to bring these vines back to life. How do I do that? What I found out is actually vines thrive under abuse. Grapevines thrive under abuse. Now, I I don't mean abuse in the the sort of like, you know, God is abusive thing. But I'm saying is the more you cut them back, the more fruitful they are. Because so much water flows through grapevines. Those, those vines that go out, when you trim one, you'll actually just see it just dripping water. And so much water goes through. When you cut away branches that are not bearing fruit, you know what happens? More water, more resources, more nutrients go to the ones that do bear fruit. The pruning process actually makes them more fruitful and healthier. Now listen, I want to draw a straight line from what... Jesus said there about the Father to our lives. The restrictions that he puts in place in our life, the ways that he trims us back, are not because he delights in placing limitations on us, but because he delights in the amount of fruit that we bear. And when all of a sudden I say, hey, you know, that relationship is not healthy or this use of my time does not bring glory to God. And I start to trim back the different areas of my life and I allow God to prune. Now, sometimes God will do that sovereignly of his own will and he will bring that work into your life. But at other times, as you, if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, after the hall of faith in the first few verses of Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, that we're running this race for the kingdom, right? We're ready, we're headed towards the finish line. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And, and because we know that that's true, what we're supposed to do then is lay aside every sin and weight that holds us back, that besets us from being able to run the race. And listen, guys, there are weights pulling on us from all directions, pulling at our time, pulling at our possessions, pulling at our money, pulling at our relationships, pulling us in every direction. And sometimes we just have to prune stuff back. We have to simplify. And if we don't, God who loves us will come along and he'll prune it back for us. But can I suggest something? It's so much easier when you voluntarily just examine your life and begin to lay aside weight. This is besetting me. This is slowing me down. I'm going to streamline for efficiency. I'm going to live this life differently. This brings me to my last point, guys. It is our joy to do that. It's not a harm to us. It's a joy to do that. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46 Jesus gives two parables of the kingdom. He says, he says look, it's like a guy who's, who's plowing in a field. He's just moving along in a field. And then all of a sudden, the plow tips up a treasure chest. And he's like, oh, there's so much treasure. Now, in those days, it was very common to bury your money. That was, a way, that was like a way to safe keep it. But also was common is to like forget where you buried it. <laughs> right? So he's plowing along the field, tips up some treasure, and he's like, oh, man. So he just covers it all up, and then he sells everything he has to come and buy the entire field. Now he owns the field and the treasure that's in it. And then he gives another parable, and he says, it's it's like a merchant who likes to buy pearls. And then upon finding one pearl of great price, he sells everything that he has to purchase the one pearl. Why? 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 Because both the man who bought the field and the merchant who bought the pearl, both of those guys see that the treasure that they possess in that is worth everything else they have to give up. The treasure they possess in the kingdom is worth whatever sacrifices have to be made to enjoy the kingdom. 
Guys, it's not laborious to live simply and to prioritize our lives. It is our joy to do so. Like a treasure in a field, this means the reorientation of our lives where we find something of greater value than anything else. It's a form of attachment because we become attached to the love of the treasure of the kingdom. And then that pushes the other attachments in our lives towards the exits of our lives. This is not a burden or sad to us. It is a joy. We want what the treasure is. We come to want what we behold in the kingdom more than we want anything else in the world because we see its unfading, eternal value. I'm going to invite the team to come back up and close us out in worship, but I want to say this in closing. It's easy to think of a restricted life as a terrible life. A life where we make choices to not do things in order to be able to do other things. When we make choices about values it, and we say this matters more than these other things, it, there's a, a, a tendency in our flesh to feel like this is somehow a restriction that is that is unhelpful or unnecessary or takes away from our joy. But I want us to see that living under the rule of King Jesus actually is a blessing. It affects our relationships. It, affect, it affects how we steward our time, our money, our possessions, our passions, our talent, our work. It will affect the way that we use our bodies, the way we think, our emotional well-being. It is all-encompassing. Now, if this request was made by a dictator, you know, like somebody evil, the request immediately feels invasive and untenable. But the one who has called us to this life is the same, the same one who lives that life for us, died in our place, took our sins upon him, and loves us literally to death and back. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. I have a hard time trusting myself to someone that I fear. But when I see the heart of God, when I see his deep commitment to my salvation, when I see that he has pursued me and he says, this weight is holding you back, let's prune it off. All of a sudden I go, Man, if you love me enough to save me, then I, I'm on your side. But let's trim that away. You're saying that this is going to be better for me? I already know your heart towards me. If you call me to less screen time, if you call me to more focused family time, if you call me to put the kingdom first and love my neighbor, if you call me to love my enemies, if you call me to, to put my treasures in eternity and not waste them here on earth, it's for my good, and God, I already am assured of how much you love me. I trust you. I'm going to step into that. Let's prune it together. Because we know how much he loves us, we also know that when he prunes us, it's for our good. We can trust him. For those of you here and those of you online, there is an exercise for you to do. There's a printout that you can get from our website that will walk you through an, an exercise in, in, in just weighing the priorities in your life. Beginning to think, like, am I living kingdom-centered or am I living something else? And it's an opportunity for us all to step into some form of action as an act of worship to offer ourselves body, soul, and spirit to God and say, Lord, you have all of me. All the areas are yours. Time, possession, it's all yours. How do I use it for your glory? So I invite you to do that. Take part in that. Let's pray. Father, as we
we worship you, as we turn our hearts to you. God, I know that I, in my own heart, even in preparing for this teaching, immediately things rise to the surface where I realize I have misaligned priorities. Lord, as you bring those things to the surface by the Holy Spirit, show us how we can partner with you in pruning them back and laying aside the weight and running in simplicity. So God, use your word today for your glory. In Jesus' name.